Good evening, everybody. It is Friday night. It is, oh, just about 8 p.m. You're watching the Wrestling Channel. I am Blake Norton here to bring you 60 minutes of the latest news, latest interviews, and much, much more. It is the Bagpipe Report. This week, we've got Harley Race talking about his new book. We got him talking about his appearance on Raw recently, Hall of Fame, much, much more. We've got Brian Alvarez on the phone from Seattle, Washington, talking about uh, SummerSlam last Sunday, big review of the show. We've got Mo Cather all the way over from England from Power Slam Magazine to tell us the latest happenings in Japan and much, much more. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the next 60 minutes, sit down, enjoy the ride, because it's going to be off the hook, off the chain, off the camels and small animals. It's going to be red hot, red hot. This is the Bagpipe Report. guys, how are you doing this evening? This is the Bagpipe Report. I am Blake Norton and I'm here to talk to you about wrestling and news for the next 60 minutes. We're going to kick it off with the biggest story making the rounds this week. WWE ratings have hit record lows. Raw and SmackDown this past week had ratings lower than they have had in several years. This is major concern to the company. Oftentimes times when there's a low rating they'll pass it off or maybe there's a holiday going on or an NBA game or something like that. We had both Raw and SmackDown last week doing worse numbers than they've done in years now. And especially because it was the week leading up to SummerSlam, their second biggest pay-per-view of the year, that's going to cause a lot of concern in the WWE camp. Now, every time the ratings go down, they have a tendency to change plans, change directions. It's hard to say exactly what kind of direction they have right now. The Raw Diva search doesn't seem to be doing the trick for ratings, and I certainly don't think they're making their cool quarter mill back out of the lovely ladies in scanty clothing. In the next couple of weeks, it's going to be interesting to see where we go, but Good Money says that things are going to be swapped around a bit. Headliners, maybe we'll see some new ones, maybe we'll see some old ones come back. As well as that, every time the ratings go down, you always see a trend from Mr. Man. he'll bring back some of the older guys, some of the time-tested, proven commodities such as your Hulk Hogan's, your Roddy Pipers. Could low ratings mean that he's going to reach out to names of yesteryear again, as he's done so in the past? Only time will tell, but keep watching your sets because the next couple of weeks are set to be pretty interesting as we see how Damage Control handles this situation. For the second time in her WWE career, Rena Sable Mero, no longer Rena Mero since splitting with her husband Mark Mero, is gone from WWE. The whole story seemed to start a couple of weeks ago when to the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette she made some quite interesting comments about the WWE locker room. She talked about how women are treated based on their looks and based on who they talk to more than their actual talent. Of course, Rena, five years ago, sued WWE, uh, talked about sexual harassment, talked about how she was mistreated and all such things. That seemed to be patched up and let go when she rejoined the company about this time last year, had some big profile angles with Vince McMahon and Stephanie Stephanie McMahon, which is rather interesting given their past. As well as the situation with the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, there's also talk from PWInsider.com that she'd asked for her schedule to be reduced. One of the major factors there would obviously be the fact that she's dating Brock Lesnar right now, and Lesnar, of course, left WWE for the NFL a couple of months ago. One way or the other, Sable is gone from WWE, leaving Tori Wilson to take her rightful spot as the queen of WWE Divas on SmackDown. Good news for Jeff Hardy fans. During an interview last week, he was on Between the Ropes, a radio show over in the U.S. He said that he isn't feeling burned out anymore and that he's actually thinking about toning down his in-ring style to prevent further injuries and wearing himself down. During his big run with WWE, which spanned 1999 to 2003, Hardy was legendary for destroying his body in every manner of ways. There have been plenty of rumors off screen which are completely unfounded as of right now to do with his personal habits and drug use and all that glorious rock star stuff. More importantly, on screen, he's done some amazing spots, amazing stunts and dives, things which can only serve to shorten a wrestler's career. According to his interview on radio, he's hyped, he's ready to come back, and he also said that he was very close to coming back to WWE, but much like we talked about here on TBR a couple of weeks ago, he didn't feel he was ready for the schedule, he wasn't ready to commit. He was this close, but he just felt it wasn't time for him. Does this mean he'll be back in WWE in the future? For now, he's going to do the two dates a week with NWA TNA, and he's going to see where it goes from there. But fans of Jeff Hardy, 
Looks like Jeff might be rejuvenating his career. For what it's worth, there's been a lot of talk that the last couple of weeks for TNA, he's been showing up early and working very, very hard. Okay, as promised, back in studio we have the Land of the Rising Sun, one of their top reporters, Mo Cathra from Power Slam Magazine. Mo, it's a pleasure to have you back with us in the Bagpipe Report. Thanks, Blake. Nice for. Nice to be back. Absolutely. And the top story we've got going on right now is Loki. We've seen so much of him in the U.S. We've seen him in uh, TNA, uh, Ring of Honor, so many U.S. promotions right here on the Wrestling Channel. Uh, he's also a big star in Japan, and he's apparently exodist from one promotion to the other this last month. What's happening with Loki? Loki, over the past year and a half, has become a huge star for the Zero One promotion. Mm -hmm. That's one of the promotions we don't show on the Wrestling Channel, but it's one of the biggest in Japan. And uh, he's headed to Pro Wrestling Noah. He had a falling out with Zero One over money, and uh, he wasn't happy with what they had to offer. So he made a call to Pro Wrestling Noah. Um, seeing that this guy was available, they signed him up, and uh, he's starting later this month. And he's ready to wrestle with some of the best junior heavyweights in the world, such as Kenta, Naomi Marufuji, and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. So the potential for awesome matches that low key could take part in are just unbelievable. That sounds absolutely excellent. And now because he's with Noah, hopefully we'll get to see him over here wrestling for Noah as well sometime soon. That's right, yes. Another promotion that we have will, is having their G1 Climax right now, a big annual tournament. Hopefully we'll be seeing that here in TWC in the next couple of months. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, G1 Climax is New Japan's biggest tournament. It's been going for 14 years. And they've just concluded this past week. And the tournament was a huge success with some great sellout shows and the wrestlers were just on real fire, producing some awesome, awesome matches. I've seen some of them already, um, and we're going to bring those to Wrestling Channel viewers in a couple of months' time. And there was plenty of shocks, plenty of surprises, and it's just going to be awesome to watch, and we're going to bring it here for Wrestling Channel viewers. Excellent. Now, you are telling me right before we went on the air that Yoshihiro uh, Takayama is now nursing some serious injuries. Uh, I've heard different uh, reports, whether they're legit or fake, or what's happening. What's happening with Yoshihiro? Right, now he was in the G1 Climax tournament, and on the second night of the tournament, he had a very brutal match against Kensuke Sasaki. It was an amazing, amazing match. They were really laying into one another in just a ferocious manner, and he suffered an injury from that match, and as well as that, he had a match against Manabu Nakanishi on the opening night of the G1, mm -hmm. where he suffered another head injury, and to make matters worse, he had another head injury a few nights before wrestling for Pro Wrestling Noah against Takuma Sano. So the combination of these three injuries caused him to have what's called a cerebral thrombosis, mm -hmm. which is equivalent to almost a stroke. And um, doctors advise him, you know, just stay away from a wrestling ring for the next few months and just get yourself sorted out because this is potentially life-threatening. Mm -hmm. Yoshiro Takayama over the last couple of years has just been an incredible performer. He's, he was a mediocre wrestler for a good few years. He'd been around in the shoot scene, wrestling for UWFI in the mid-90s, joined All Japan in the late 90s and had a very good run there, but was still not a very good wrestler. But last couple of years, he's just come on so strong and he's had big, huge mixed martial arts fights which have made him a huge celebrity in Japan. So he's arguably the most popular wrestler in Japan at the moment. And losing him in the G1 was a blow to New Japan's G1 tournament. Mm -hmm. but. Hopefully he'll get better, and I'm sure he'll be back in the coming months. Well, certainly our best of wishes to him for a speedy recovery. Yep. Uh, moving on to other programming notes, apparently we've got some new NOAA footage coming up here on TWC. What can we expect to see in the next couple of months? That's right. Um, since we started the Wrestling Channel in March, we've been showing 2001 coverage for Pro Wrestling NOAA, which has been pretty cool. But Pro Wrestling NOAA really, really started to come on strong in 2003. It won numerous accolades, numerous awards for its great matches and great programming and their stars were just amazing last year, mm. and they've carried that on in this year. They've had some incredible shows, incredible matches. They're my promotion of the year so far, and we're glad to announce that starting next week, we're gonna be starting off with 2004 coverage of Pro Wrestling Noah. So you're gonna see some awesome matches such as Kabashi against Takayama, and numerous others, the junior heavyweights in particular, have been incredible, and I can't wait to bring that to wrestling channel viewers over the coming months. That sounds absolutely excellent. What else from the Japanese scene can we be looking forward to here on TWC? Right, this Sunday we've got Super J Cup 1994, which is a tournament held in 1994 by New Japan Pro Wrestling. It was a one-night junior heavyweight tournament, 
and many consider it to be the greatest wrestling show of all time. It's legendary. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So that's going to be something every single viewer watching this show needs to check out, I'm telling you, because uh, whether you're a fan of Japanese wrestling or not, it's something that's just an amazing show full of awesome matches. Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero on the show and a lot of other familiar faces and it was just a tremendous experience. And then as well as that, we've got up-to-date coverage of Gaia. Also, much like Pro Wrestling Noah, we had been showing 2001 coverage of Gaia and a couple of weeks back, we upgraded to 2004 coverage and we've got some tremendous action from the likes of Chigusa Nagayo, who is uh, Gaia's biggest star, and Manami Toyota, who is perhaps the greatest female wrestler in the history of pro wrestling. And they're just going to be producing some great stuff week after week. Gaia, 11 o'clock Friday nights. That sounds wonderful. Mo Cather from Power Slam Magazine. Thank you very much for updating us here on the Bagpipe Report. And we'll have you back again very soon. Cheers, Blake. Take care. Thanks. Okay, this coming Sunday, we got the super card, and it is a super card of super cards. The creme de la creme, the Super J Cup from 1994. I have yet to see this myself, but if you've been a wrestling fan for a while, you've probably heard of it. It doesn't matter if you don't watch Japanese wrestling, it doesn't matter if you're into North America and what part of the world you like, this is a tournament to see. I have heard about it from so many different people, so many different places. It is legendary in this business, and you owe it to yourself as a wrestling fan to check it out. Shameless plug because it is a great tournament. We've got, uh, let's see who we got here. Chris Benoit is in it. Uh, Dean Malenko is in it. Great Suzuki. You might remember it from WWE a couple of years ago and uh, ECW as well. He had that very strong feud. It was just incredible. Made just incredible uh, PJ, one the star that he is today in many people's eyes. Uh, Jushin Liger versus Hayabusa is a first round match. Hayabusa, the legendary high risk taker versus Jushin Liger, one of the all time greats from Japan. Uh, Black Tiger versus Takamishi Noku. Black Tiger, Eddie Guerrero, 10 years ago under a mask, uh, much the same way Chris Benoit used to wrestle in Japan as a Pegasus Kid, uh, Owen Hart, Dynamite Kid, so many great guys wrestle in Japan early in their career. This is the Super J Cup Tournament from 1994. Here's a little preview. It happens this Sunday, 8 p.m., right here on the Wrestling Channel. This week, we keep it right here at home. It's the FWA. James Tai introduces us to a new form of sunset flip, one which involves a little bit of sunsetting, a little bit of flipping, a little bit of German suplexing, and a lot of victory. It's very cool. Check it out. James now flips over. And oh, oh my God! God. And they and the three. Three. It is the three count. It is the three count. James Tai. On the phone right now from Seattle, Washington, we have Brian Alvarez, the editor of the Figure Four Weekly Newsletter, here to review uh, this past Sunday's SummerSlam pay-per-view from WWE. How are you getting on, Brian? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Good stuff. We had SummerSlam last Sunday. It is WWE's second biggest show of the year. Expectations are pretty high going in, as we were talking about before. Uh, first of all, what are your overall views of the show? Me personally, I thought it was a good card. I didn't think there was any major match of the year candidates. There are some very good matches, but no full-blown match of the years. Uh, overall, I thought it was a pretty solid card. What were your thoughts? I thought it was all right. Uh, I thought the main event was good. I thought uh, Eddie Nangle was good. Uh, I thought David Dodgeball was... Actually, I thought that was 
highly entertaining because the uh, WWE girls just got uh, squashed. Oh, was that a shoot? What, what was that? I think it was. Because if it wasn't, then they're really stupid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was entertaining in a strange sort of way, and it was short. But uh, I mean, overall, uh, it was not the best card of the year, but I have seen worse, so. What was with the crowd reactions? The way I read it, and there's so many different ways to read it, of course, when you go into any one given town or one given arena on any one given night, you can get weird reactions, especially when you're outside the U.S., and they were in Toronto, Canada. The way I read it, this may be a bit pessimistic on my part, but basically was that the crowd had a lot of semi-quasi-inside fans, and the WWE essentially got bitten in the ass for not following up on storylines, not being consistent, and the fans were pretty much letting them know that and saying, there's a lot of guys here we don't want pushed, and there's a lot of things here which we don't really buy, and a lot of things which insult our intelligence. But there's a lot of ways to pick up on it. But they, they cheered for heels all, all night, and they even booed Edge out of the building, and he's a babyface from Toronto. What did you make of it? Well, Toronto is just like, they're a, a really weird city. And every time WWE goes to Toronto, there's some sort of strange reaction to somebody. That was... You know, they did Rock and Hogan. It was in Toronto, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the uh, that was that weird night where everybody just went insane for Hogan and booed Rock. So yeah, maniac Satan. They're just okay. uh, you know they're their own fans, and they uh, they just cheer who they want, and they don't cheer who they don't want, and that's pretty much it. Now you were talking last week about how you expected uh, John Heidenreich and Shawn Michaels to be back at the show. Now the guy came back. Should we be expecting him to come back on television this week? I don't, I don't know about Heidenreich, because I don't think he should ever come back to television, but as far as Michaels goes, I think uh, his wife didn't Gave have birth. a baby yet, and that was the deal there. If mm -hmm. she didn't have it, he wasn't going to be at the show. Mm -hmm. But uh, he should be back, you know, any time, because he's got matches scheduled for September, and uh, Heidenreich, probably the same deal. Okay, moving right ahead here, let's take a look at some of the bigger matches on the show. Now, the, the undercard, as usual, and we've sort of gotten used to this, and I, I keep talking about this, is that... WWE has this philosophy where they feel the only the top couple of matches will draw, so that's the emphasis of the card. The thing I don't really understand is that if the undercard matches aren't really meant to draw, why do they put in so many when there could be so many good matches? Or is it intentional that matches like the six-man tag and the triple threat, which only went eight minutes, even though it had three big stars, Batista, Chris Jericho, and Edge, it only went eight minutes long. Is, are they intentionally kept short so people will have uh, more of an appetite for longer matches for the mains? I think they just do it because they want the main event matches to go longer. And the thing with WWE is you're always going to have the guys complaining about something. This week there were guys complaining that there was no Raw tag title match. Instead it was Diva Beach Volleyball. Mm -hmm. And so what they try and do is just get as many guys as they possibly can on a card. And when you have a joint pay-per-view now, there's even less slots for each side. So I think their idea is we'll just put as many matches as we can, we'll just keep them short, uh, you know, so we have time for the long main event, mm. and uh, that's it. There was talk going into Undertaker versus uh, John Bradshaw Layfield that it would be a horrific match. I didn't feel that way. I thought it was fine. Uh, the crowd uh, certainly, I don't want to say take, took away from it, they changed it. They had a giant Mexican wave during the match. What do you think of the match? And it was pretty much a finish we expected. It was just a, a, a non-finish. And coming out of that match, where does that leave Bradshaw for his next challenger? Uh, the way they did the finish probably means they're going to do another uh, match with Undertaker, maybe some three ways or something like that. Oh, God. But uh, I wasn't blown away by it. I kind of expected it to be worse. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought the crowd killed it actually really because i couldn't even pay any attention to the match at all i was watching everybody do the wave and mm. their chants and everything like that and and uh undertaker looked like he wanted to kill somebody and <laughs> bradshaw was actually very calm and he's been very calm under the circumstances a lot lately when things yeah. have not gone his way but uh you know uh it wasn't horrible or anything like that but it I, I, I got to say, though, I mean, come on, it's, it's Undertaker and John Bradshaw Layfield. I mean, we know their spots. We know what they're going to do. W was the match going to be all that interesting for the midsection anyway? Well, I, I think the thing is that there's just, like, Undertaker's been around for 12 years, and nothing new ever happens with him. It's always the same storyline. It's so-and-so scared of the Undertaker. And you can only see it so many times. Mm -hmm. And it was great to bring him back as a dead man for, you know, WrestleMania or whatever, but it's been overdone now. Yeah. And even keeping him off TV for so long still hasn't done anything for anybody. So it doesn't really surprise me that they got this reaction because really it's like you've got the world title on Bradshaw 
and he's feuding with a dead guy, and I just can't understand, you know, really how anybody could possibly care about it. Mm -hmm. Let's move over to uh, the Raw side of things now for a minute. Uh, in the Raw situation, we had Triple H versus Eugene, which was some fun heel stuff from Hunter, I thought. Um, but Eugene, the, the Eugene character seems like the, the Toronto crazy crowd or crazy land or whatever it was, bizarre world, I think Michael Cole called it, aside, how much longer can the Eugene character go on? Uh, it was pretty much a non-match. Nothing special happened in it. It was a finish we expected. How much longer can the Eugene character go on before they have to take it somewhere else and probably just crap all over the fans by making it out not to be real because surely Nick Dinsmore can't be a retard the rest of his wrestling career. I'm not sure, but I know that the uh, the Eugene they have right now can't last forever, and uh, they had a real tough match until like the last three minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes when uh, he started doing the like finishers. awesome spots and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a tough character. It would probably last longer if he wasn't on TV every single week, but uh, they seem intent on doing that. And uh, like you said. The best course of action would be for just Dinsmore to turn heel and reveal that he's not so special after all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm sure at some point they'll have to do that, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, and then in the Raw main event, we had Chris Benoit versus Randy Orton. I thought, and I, this is the thing, again, I, I always say this, is that I don't understand how one month you can have uh, Paul Bearer dying under a flood of concrete on pay-per-view and all that stuff, and then the next month you can have an incredibly solid match where, in my opinion, by the end of the match, I bought Randy Orton as a world champion. Uh, a lot of that, in my opinion, is due to Chris Benoit. I thought the match was incredible. Benoit put really put both barrels into it to put An Orton over and have a great match. And I thought the finish just added credibility, made the whole show great, made WWE look good, made the sport of wrestling look good. It was a feel-good moment. What did you think about the match, and what do you think of Randy Orton going away with the title? What, how, what kind of a champion is he going to be? It looked from the way they ended the show that he's going to be a baby face. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure. That could just be a setup for him doing something really dastardly tonight. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have no idea, but I thought it was a, a great match, and the good thing about it was, you know, they'd been pushing Orton so hard for so many months as the Intercontinental Champion, and uh, he lost to Edge, and they'd been pushing Benoit so hard for so many months as the World Champion that he was actually like, the people saw him as the champion, which they don't see with Bradshaw, for yeah. example. Yeah. And so when Orton beat him clean... I think just right then everybody saw Orton as the champion, champion yeah. which is exactly what you need. And the thing is, it's a follow-up. And normally I'm worried about the follow-up because a lot of times they do something really great and then just totally screw it up the next night. But they are intent on making uh, Orton like uh, the guy. And they've been pushing him as the guy for uh, months and months and months now. They did everything right last night. And so uh, I have no doubt that that's going to continue. Because the other thing you have to look at is Hunter's going to beat this guy someday, and he wants to be the world champion, doesn't want to beat a geek. So uh, they're going to push him as a world champion. Do you think that it's proof, given that w with this Randy Orton push, we've seen when WWE wants to get behind a guy and push him and make him credible, Orton has done very well in his role. He's worked very hard, and he's a very talented uh, young man. But WWE, more than anything else, has shown that they know exactly what to do when they really want to put a guy over. Does that pr does this prove once and for all that champions like the, the Chris Jericho caliber of champion who had the title for a couple of months and then had it taken away, or, or maybe even Eddie Guerrero to a degree, history will tell us about this one. Do you think this proves that whether a guy makes it over or not, WWE really has more control than people often assume? Because I remember, I go back to the Jericho thing a couple of years ago when he won the world title, and uh, everybody was saying, you know, Jericho wasn't main event caliber. Caliber. He didn't have enough heat going for him. And this has happened for so many different guys. And Jericho is just an example. When the fact was is that he was never pushed as a strong champion. He was never pushed as a strong character where Orton has. Do you think it proves once and for all that WWE really can make a star out of most people if they really want to? Uh, I don't think they can make a star out of most people. I, I, think, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that Vince McMahon knows how to push a guy to the moon. Mm. Uh, and it's actually really easy. The problem is you need to find a guy who can carry the ball, as they always say. I yeah. mean, Orton, he cuts a good promo. He looks good. He wrestles. He's a good wrestler. He's getting uh, phenomenally better than he was uh, uh, when he first started. But uh, think a guy like John Heidenreich. They can push that guy uh, forever, and it's never going to work. 
so um, it's 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 a combination of a million different factors. Uh, half of it being the company, half of it being the guy that they're pushing, half of it just being uh, whether the fans uh, care about this person, mm-hmm. which uh, also has to do with how he's pushed and and how he uh, carries the ball. But Orton's a guy. Uh, he's like Rock, where uh, he's the whole package. And when you put everything you've got behind the whole package, uh, it works. And when you put everything you've got behind uh, a giant redwood tree, it just doesn't work. <laughs> On that note, we'll leave you right there. Thank you very much, Brian Alvarez from the Figure Four Weekly Newsletter. Uh, you can check that out at WrestlingObserver.com. We will talk to you soon. Cool. See you. Take care. Joining us now on the line, live from the United States, is one of the all-time greats of professional wrestling. You saw him earlier this year when he was inducted to the WWE Hall of Fame, introduced by Nature Boy Ric Flair, making his appearance at WrestleMania 20 in Madison Square Garden. He's involved in many fantastic projects right now, and he's here to tell us about all of them and his take on the current scene of professional wrestling. This is Harley Race. Hey, Harley, how are you doing? Fine, my friend. How are you? Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. I know you've got a, a whole lot of projects you're working on right now, and we'll be talking about them later, uh, as well as talking about the business today. And, in fact, speaking of the business today, uh, I wanted to start off real quick. You did an angle a couple of months ago on Raw with uh, Bob Orton's son, Randy Orton, uh, and he just won the World Championship last weekend. How, how did you come about to doing that angle, and did you mind that he was spitting in your face, or were you all good with the, good with the angle? Well, I wasn't too happy about the spitting in the face, but uh, I go back to his grandfather, Bob Orton Sr. Mm -hmm. Him and I used to play golf probably two or three times a week together. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Bob Orton Jr., I was with him uh, when he started wrestling in uh, Ted Turner's organization in uh, Atlanta in the early 70s. Back then it was uh, still uh, Jim Crockett and right. associated with the NWA. Mm-hmm. You were also involved with the Hall of Fame earlier this year, and the two uh, appearances are, are put closely together. Uh, you were shown at WrestleMania, you came out on the stage in Madison Square Garden. How do you feel about the WWE Hall of Fame? Do you think it's, do you feel that it's a legitimate, respectful Hall of Fame for the business? Well, it's, it should be a respectful Hall of Fame. They've got some people in there that, that really deserve to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Pete Rose thing, of course, is a controversy, but yeah, I had no problem with it. Pete's been involved in two or three different WrestleManias and going in as a celebrity honor, honoree. As, a, as no opposed to a, a great wrestler. A lot of people yeah. in America do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, when we talk about wrestling today, um, I want to get your opinion on this because right now you're involved in, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but you're involved in training. Uh, You've been helping a lot of people over the years since you retired from the ring. You've also been helping inspire a new generation of wrestlers in the ring. What is the difference between what separates an opening card wrestler and a main event wrestler today and the criteria for what a great wrestler was or an opening card wrestler in, in your prime 20 or 30 years ago? Well, 20 or 30 years ago, um, you had to wrestle. You had to know the basics of wrestling versus uh, nowadays it's more uh, learn how to take uh, big, uh, goofy-looking bumps Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There's a lot of talented young men out there that are in wrestling today that in my day they would have been on top also. You take the Chris Benoit's, Mm -hmm. uh, the Kurt Engels, the Triple H. Mm -hmm. Triple H is such a talented young man. And he's got a lot of the stuff that I do down to a a T. Him and Benoit both do. Uh, and, And then there's a lot of young guys out there that are strictly there that are uh, for the art of being able to take a big outlandish bump. Mm -hmm. Those people won't be around long because the accumulation of that will take them out. Mm -hmm. Now a couple of guys from uh, 
your, that you've wrestled uh, 20 or 30 years ago, Ric Flair, Terry Funk, Dusty Rhodes, I want to ask you about in particular. Those three names are still wrestling regularly, particularly Flair and Funk. Do you think it's a testament to them that they're still going? Or do you feel that, um, personal feelings aside, it would be better if they stood aside at this point in their career? Well, all joking aside, Flair should have retired uh, quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry has probably retired more times than anyone else put together uh, in the history of, of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess as long as they think they're still physically able to do it and people will pay to see it, why not hell with it? Mm -hmm. I do know if I was, I was smart enough to get out of it at a point in time where I could not do it at the same level that I had been doing it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Whether that whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. I, in my own mind, I think I made the right decision because I didn't want to belittle myself by not being able to do things that I used to do. Mm -hmm. When we talk about people aging and wrestling, it moves into the topic of the high mortality rate in the business. And you've been exposed to that perhaps more than anybody. You, you performed, uh, you tried to save Iron Mike DiBiase. You tag teamed with uh, the late Kurt Hennig's father, Larry the Axe Hennig. Uh, you were very close to the Hart family, and I remember you coming out and giving the introductions when uh, uh, Bret Hart and Chris Benoit had the tribute match to Owen on Nitro about five years ago. Why do you think there's such a high mortality rate in wrestling, and is there anything constructive that can be done, or is it simply a part of the business and a part of people's individual personal lives? Well, this is a question that you'll probably get a different answer from whoever you interview about it. Uh, back in the days of Mike DiBiase, Teddy's father, mm -hmm. he was a 50-plus year old man who had moved his whole family in one day, came there totally exhausted, and the panhandle of Texas, you're up in a pretty good altitude. So his his was just exhaustion uh, to the point where it, it, it caused him to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other guys that you just named, uh, there was other there was other factors involved in their death uh, mm -hmm. other than just hard work. Yeah. How badly do you think kayfabe? being exposed has hurt the business? Of course, this is an ironic question because if, if the business was never exposed, you wouldn't be working on this project, for, for example, about the book and the DVD. But this happened many years ago. This isn't a new thing. Uh, do you think that the business suffers today for the fact that it was essentially exposed to the mass public over the last 10 years? Well, first off, I'm going to ask you a question and see if you understand it. Shoot. I don't understand it. <laughs> well, see, K. Fabe's not totally broke there. <laughs> I just asked you, and Carney, when did you learn how to speak it? That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, when Vince walked out and volunteered to the world that everyone does exactly what he says, uh, the business bottomed out for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, when Senator Kefauver uh, from the state of Tennessee, when they took wrestling and at that point in time hockey uh, and declared it a show rather than a sport, and hockey has never ever uh, uh, really come back from that to what it was. You know, hockey's doing. Uh, pretty decent now, but somebody has been knocking the wrestling business since the conception, and I, you know, it's never going to change. Uh, the Secrets of Wrestling show that was out a couple of years ago, do you have, going into it, I've talked to Michael Modest about, and it, he was very angry about the way that he was portrayed in it and the way it portrayed the business. How did you go into it, and do you feel that... Why would he be angry? Uh, he was 
one of the people that were right there. Uh, he was also one of the guys that uh, was under under a mask. Everyone involved in that stupid ass thing, which I was misled coming out there to start with. Mm -hmm. Every one of them head under a mask except me. Mm -hmm. I said, if I'm going to do this, at least I'm going to have the balls enough to let everybody know that it is me. Right. Modest didn't do anything. or They didn't say anything about Modest that wasn't uh, basically the truth. Mm -hmm. I got him out of the middle of it when they give him the pile driver. What what did you expect it to be? What what was it portrayed to you to be? And and were you unhappy with the results? It was per, it was per, portrayed to me before I left Kansas City that I was coming out there to be involved in a documentary on wrestling. Right. Not the bullshit that it wound up being. Right. Uh, at that point in time, I had flown. Uh, Two and a half hours. I had been there for uh, well over a day uh, before they uh, got me involved in it, and then I just bit the bullet, went along with it, hell with it. Was there ever was there a turning point halfway through where you realized, wait a second, this isn't a documentary. This is something which is meant to degrade the business. This is something which is meant to expose it for a fast buck. Well, not so much that it degraded the business. If you remember back then, Vince McMahon had just been out on national television telling everybody that he was the boss of wrestling. Mm -hmm. People did exactly what he told them to, when and how he told them to do it. Yep. So I wasn't proud of what I did, but I wasn't the guy that opened that door. Do you, do you have a problem with the way Vince has done that with the business? Because a lot of uh, the way this developed was when WWE, or d then WWF, was starting to slip in the ratings to WCW. They're looking around for different ideas. And they had Vince Russo come in. And Vince Russo, a lot of people say, is not a wrestling person and shouldn't have been in that writing position. Uh, what do you think of Vince Russo's work? And do you hold Vince McMahon responsible for a lot of the negative changes which took place? Well, Vince is the only person that's totally responsible for it. Uh, he could he could have said no when Russo come up with a lot of the horseshit he came up with. Uh, Russo, had he had been around in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, somebody would have beat the shit out of him and thrown him out the door a long time ago. What kind of example do you try to set with your promotion for the other promotions in the in the U.S. right now? All my guys know how to wrestle on the mat. Mm -hmm. They're taught that. Mm -hmm. They're also taught that anytime they're on the mat and they're moving around and they're, what they're doing on the mat is interesting to what the people are, or, you know, to the people that are watching. Each time that you're going through, say, five, ten minutes of that, think of the years you're adding to your career getting away from taking all those horrendous bumps. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying that the bumps are totally out of it because they can't be. Mm -hmm. Well, Harley Race, uh, you can check out his official website at harleyrace.com. He's involved in many interesting projects we just talked about. Uh, his book is coming out soon. He's involved in training camps, training many of the up-and-coming potential great stars of the future in professional wrestling. And check out the World League of Wrestling, his own promotion, which we hope will continue to set standards for what the business used to be and what it should be, and hopefully continue to maintain great standards, which many times have been lost in modern wrestling. Harley Race, thank you very much for joining us here on the Bagpipe Report. You're welcome, my friend, and uh, give me a jingle anytime you like to talk. We certainly will. Take care. Thank you.
week, another 200 pounds worth of merchandise from a TWC online store. Check it out at www.thewrestlingchannel.tv slash shop. You got all your merchandise from all over the world. All the best promotions are represented. 200 pounds of it. Would you like it? Would you like it for free? Would you like to win it via competition? You can do it this week. Very simple question. What famous comedian had a legendary feud with Jerry Lawler in Memphis? Your answer is either A, Andy Hunter, B, Handy Andy, or C, Andy Kaufman. You can send your answer. It's either Blake A, Blake B, or Blake C, depending on which you think it is, and you send it to 88066. Each entry costs £1.50, and the closing date is midnight on Thursday, the 26th of August. It's time once again to delve into the TBR mailbag for this week's Q&A. The first question comes from Danny in West Yorkshire, who asks... In the future, myself and my friend are going to try to get into the wrestling business. Do you have any suggestions on how we can start up? Well, Danny, that's quite a question. For one thing, you didn't specify whatsoever what area of the wrestling business, and there are so many different areas. If you're interested in perhaps the promotional side, for example, that is a long and hard road, and you're going to want to learn that from other people who promote wrestling. If you talk to any independent wrestling promoter out there, and except for perhaps Insert Man, he's probably the exception uh, around these parts, they're going to tell you it's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of slogging, it's a lot of losing money. It is not something you can throw together a show. Think about this. You're going to need a wrestling ring, thousands of pounds. You're going to need venues, thousands of pounds down payment. You're going to need wrestlers. You're going to need name wrestlers so people will come to see the show. You're going to need to pay the wrestlers transportation. It's very, very complicated. If you want to get into the journalism side, it's easier because you're not contributing so much money up front. You don't have to pay someone to get your article printed most places anyway, depending on how good or bad a writer you are. When I started off in wrestling journalism, I started online. I simply wrote for newsletters for a couple of years before I first got my first paycheck. That was with WOW magazine. But when I went to WOW, I said, look, I've got these years behind me. I've got these newsletters, which are credible, and this is my article. This is my work. As much as building up a resume for yourself, you're going to want to develop your talent because if it's, you're at the beginning of your career, you're not going to have a style yet. It takes time to develop that same way you have to develop a style in the ring. Then if you're talking about wrestling, it's a whole different uh, fish, uh, kettle of fish altogether. You're talking about getting in there and committing yourself physically, you're going to have to get trained first. That's the most important thing. The number of emails and letters and phone calls I've gotten from people because they wanted to be a wrestler, so they started wrestling and they hurt themselves because they didn't know how, it's sad and it's mind-boggling. So if you've ever had interest in getting into the wrestling ring, you're going to want to get trained first. Find a credible place. If it takes years, you should be, you should be 18 first. You should leave high school. You should have all that th those things behind you so you have a better idea of what you want to do with your life. You don't want to jump into it too early. But if you do, go for it. Save up the money. Go somewhere credible. Don't go to the first guy who says, I'll teach you how to fall, kid. Wait until you can go somewhere where there's people you trust to learn from and then pursue a ring career. Any direction you go, best of luck, but take your time and whatever you do, be careful, it's a hard business. Our next Q&A comes from John Stockton in England who asks the following question. Hey Blake, why doesn't TWC show any action from the WWE? Well John, the simple answer is that they're already under contract to Sky Sports. The more complex answer? We don't need to. Sky Sports already shows them. TWC is very proud, and I'm very proud to be associated with them because we're showing everybody there's more flavors of ice cream out there. Most fans are already well aware of that, but there's some out there who, to whom, if you say wrestling, they think WWE. WWE is a very small part of the wrestling world, an incredibly small part. And I don't mean that in a negative way against them, but there are hundreds upon hundreds of promotions in North America alone out of their home base. You go to Japan, you go to Mexico, you've got whole different styles whole different cultures, dozens of more promotions, giant arenas being filled. A couple of weeks ago we had Michael Modest on the phone from, uh, he was on the phone from California. He'd just gotten back from Japan where he's wrestling for Noah in the Tokyo Dome in front of 60, 70,000 people. There's a massive wrestling world out there and I found personally, now that I've had the opportunity, which I haven't had the last year or two, to see so many other promotions, my interest in wrestling has been rekindled and that's what we hope to do for you too. Right now we're providing an opportunity for everybody to see wrestling from all over the world, all different styles, all 100% for free. No pay-per-view, no hang-ups, no catches. I'm not into hardcore stuff, but if you are, we got it. I love the technical stuff, and we have tons. If you like high-flying, you've got everything from Ring of Honor to Mexico, 
whole lot more. So basically, what we're here to do is we're here to cultivate your wrestling knowledge, your wrestling experience, and more than anything else, allow you to see wrestling from all over the world. And the day WWE isn't on another channel, you never know. Maybe it'll be over here right with us on the Wrestling Channel. The next question comes from Alex Smith in Nottingham, who asks, Blake, why isn't Rick Steiner wrestling regularly for a company, and does he have any plans in the future? Well, I don't know Rick all that well, so I can't tell you his future plans, but I can tell you he's still wrestling today. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, he won the championship for Harley Race's promotion, WLW, over in Japan, no less. Rick is still active in the circuit, only he's not competing for one of the major promotions we cover right now. He's not with WWE because I don't think they want him. He's not with NWA TNA because, well, maybe the money isn't good enough for him. Maybe they don't want him enough to pay him what he wants. But Rick Steiner's career is still flourishing, and don't be surprised if you, don't, if you see him around again sometime very soon right here on the Wrestling Channel. Ben Pritchard asks the following question. Blake, have you got tickets to see WWE Raw or SmackDown when they come to the UK? The answer is no, I have not, but you may, because in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having some great competitions. For the next seven weeks here on TWC, each week, we're going to be giving away a pair of tickets to see WWE. All the different places are coming in the UK uh, in the next month or two. So make sure you stay tuned to TWC to check that out. And you can also check it out. I'm sure in a couple of days, we'll have information up on the website as well, thewrestlingchannel.tv. So make sure you get your entry in. Best of luck. Hopefully, you'll get that. I'm too busy here to go running over to the Raw and SmackDown shows over in the UK, but I did catch the one over here in Ireland last month with uh, Chris Benoit defending the world title. How could you miss that? Chris Benoit, world title Ireland, you can't. It was a good show. So uh, hopefully you guys have a lot of luck with that brand new TWC competition. It should be great. Make sure you get your entries in soon. Now let's check out some dates right here at home coming up in the UK and Ireland. Premier Promotions presents the summer season of wrestling spectaculars at the Worthing Assembly Hall. Revolution British Wrestling at Selbeck Hall, London. World Association of Wrestling is hitting the new Atlantis Resort in Great Yarmouth. The WZW Path to Destruction Tour sees three back-to-back -back dates. Whitley Bay Residents Association Tyne and Ware on Friday 27th of August. The Courtham Memorial Hall, Redker on Saturday the 28th. And finally, the Starlight Suite, Tyne and Ware, Sunday the 29th of August. Garage Professional Wrestling, GPW, presents Revelations at the British Legion, Wigan. United Kingdom Pro Wrestling runs the Waterside Theatre, Long Lane, Southampton, on Friday the 3rd of September. FWA in the Morecambe Dome, check them out on September 4th. And the following night at the Broxbourne Civic Centre, September 5th, it's hot wired. It's another high octane week coming up on the Wrestling Channel this week. Here's a little look at what to watch out for as we hit the next seven days before your next TBR. On World of Sport, we've got Mal Sanders versus Keith Howard and Drew McDonald versus Johnny Wilson. On CCW Fake UTV, it's a three way dance between Mikey Tenderfoot, Jay Fury, and Spider Nate Webb. Then it's the Wife Beater versus the Messiah. If you like hardcore, check out 3PW as the Blue Meanie presents Raven, Sabu, Sandman, a three-way hardcore match. The Furious Women of Wrestling are at it again as Gaia presents Tashio Yamada versus Mayumi Ozaki and Carlos Amano versus Sakura Hirota. Then it's on to Ring of Honor High Impact TV. Biohazard versus the American Dragon, and CM Punk versus Christopher Daniels. And classic New Japan delivers with the Steiner Brothers versus Jushin Thunder Liger and the Crippler, Chris Benoit. We've got all that coming up this week, and don't forget this coming Monday, it's another exclusive RF Shoot interview with Psycho Sid Vicious, the multi-time former world champion, talks about his distinguished and controversial career in the pro wrestling game. That's about it for this week. I'm Blake Norton. This has been the Bagpipe Report right here on the Wrestling Channel. Make sure to check us out again next week at 8 p.m. Until then, check out the WrestlingChannel.tv for all your forums, all your news, all your free newsletters, and much, much more. And the BagpipeReport.com. You can catch this show, exclusive interviews, and much, much more. Next week, more of the same. The best news, the best interviews, and much, much more right here on TWC. Uh -huh.